just so I know sort of what you've got there. <laughs> oh, he printed the whole thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, then, if you look at the back, in the appendix, <clears throat> maybe we will look at that. I'm glad, I didn't mean for him to do the whole thing today, but what the heck, he did anyway. Very good, thank you, Tashi. Yeah, from the appendix. Yeah, this is what uh, we're going to better make into a booklet, I think, for the teaching. Uh, this is as much as I could boil it down. Uh, 31, they're very upset with me. They wanted me to boil it down to a few pages. <laughs> but there's 31 pages in English. And then they wanted to do it with um, Tibetan and English facing pages. That have been 62 pages. And the full length thing is in this book from Prince and Press. In English. Without a Tibetan. So, I guess we can start. Shall we start? Okay, good. So I already did really with the Manju Sri Mantra. Manju Bosatsono. Mantra. Mandara. Uh, Manju Sri is, uh, that's the beginning of Tsongkhapa's book. He says, reverence to the Guru Manju Gosha. And uh, how many of you have heard of Tsongkhapa before? Oh, a lot. That's great. A reverence to the Guru Manju Gosha. That's where he begins. Manju Gosha. And in those days, the Prince and Press wouldn't put diacritical marks in the names. So there should have been some diacritical marks here, but never mind. So uh, Manju Gosha means the gentle voice. Gosha means voice or sound. Manju means gentle. And they say Manju Gosha has a gentle voice because he is already a Buddha. And so his voice, uh, when he teaches, uh, people hear it as if it's coming from their own mind. So it can be very gentle. Because as a Buddha, he is merged with all the minds of all the beings, supposedly. And he is said to be a Bodhisattva also, Manjushri, because when he, before he became a Buddha, he, uh, he made a vow that when I'm a Buddha, I want to be a bodhisattva in all the worlds where the Buddhas, any Buddhas are teaching. Because the Buddhists from ancient time had a very sci-fi vision of multiple humanoid planets and, and heavenly realms, what they call triple universes. A universe of heaven, heaven, or human plane, human and animal plane, and then the lower realms. And um, so they, they, they feel that someone becomes a Buddha, they manifest in all many different worlds at the same time. And there are certain Buddhist sutras, which shockingly and very sci-fi like, uh, such as the Lotus Sutra, and especially with what's called the Gandavyuha, the, the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is translated in English from Chinese called the Flower Garland, Flower Ornament Sutra, uh, where uh, at the beginning of the sutra, people come from many other universes to listen to the Buddha's teaching in India, the historic Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching in India. And they kind of have a parking problem <laughs> because they come in gigantic like, like uh, skyscraper buildings which are made of interwoven flower petals and have many balustrades and balconies, but they're said to be hundreds of stories high. And all the bodhisattvas and <laughs> And people are standing on all these things, and they sort of fly in on these things. And then somebody has to park them. <laughs> There's a Bodhisattva called the Kasha Garba, which means the essence of space. I think he, he stacks them up like a three-dimensional chess board type thing. And uh, <clears throat> so, so the Manjushri is a Buddha, lives, you know, appears as a Buddha in some universe. Even now, they say, but then everywhere that there was a Buddha or is a Buddha, he appears as a Bodhisattva in order to be close to beings. And then his mantra is Om Ara Bhajanadi, his main mantra, his heart mantra, Om Ara Bhajanadi. And Ara Bhajana, Bhajana means to ripen or to cause to evolve, to cook, literally. And Ara is a contraction of Sarva Sattva, meaning all beings. And D means, D means genius or intelligence, D-H-I-H-D. 
Tomo Maramazanadi, that's his, and Om is in the front of every mantra. So that's the special mantra. When we had a, Taratuku used to stay with us, the Lama and the Amherst. Years ago, he was a professor for a while at Amherst. He didn't speak English, so I had to translate for him. And um, he, uh, he would recite that mantra all the time. And, and I asked him once, why are you always reciting Manjushri's mantras? He said, he would be saying, Omar Maramazanadi, Omar Maramazanadi, like that. He said, well, because Americans need to be more intelligent. <laughs> so I'm reciting this mantra of intelligence to try to like stimulate people's in, in, innate genius, he used to say. And um, he was discouraged sometimes, but I won't tell that story right now. So, so, so His Holiness, uh, now maybe a personal story might be good to start. So how many of you are coming to all of this whole event? There's like four or five sessions. We have a weekend retreat. Oh, good. Great. So I might as well start with a little, so we have time, because it takes time. And since His Holiness only has two days, which he very, very graciously and kindly gave to us to do this, which he had promised to do for me for a long time, really, since I translated this book like 30 years ago. And in a way, he's going to just open a certain gate to it. Like, you know, you can't cover all of the details of this, of course, in that time. So, so people would really appreciate it. We thought we would do this thing ahead of time. And uh, some people, at least, would be able to be sort of ready for him touching the sort of quintessential points. And um, my story with this book is that when I was, um, when I went back to university, to graduate school, and you know, I got through my coursework and this kind of thing, and, lear and learned Sanskrit and Chinese, and then, um, and then uh, came to the thesis time. And in the thesis time, uh, my Japanese professor wanted me to do a translation of Tsongkhapa's uh, Vipassana teaching in the Lamrim Chemo, in the great stages of the path to enlightenment, which is treating the Madhyamaka or the central central way. I call them central way, by the way, I, call, I don't call it middle way. The middle way was the Buddha's middle way between asceticism and self-indulgence, you know, severe asceticism and self-indulgence. So then people transferred that to the word Madhyamaka and they call it middle way. But then a middle way philosopher, they're kind of stuck because nobody wants to say the middleists. <laughs> it just doesn't sound right. But Madhyama also means center. Like the Madhyama, Madhyama Nadi is the central channel, for example. Madhya Pradesh in India is the central state, you know. Madhya Desha, you know, means the central country, you know. So Madhya can be center or middle. And it's, it's easy to say centrist, the centrist philosophers. You know, they don't have to be, they can be in the center of the road, they don't have to be in the middle of the road, you know, all the time. But, you know, nobody else calls it centrist. They just say either the Sanskrit Madhyamaka or middle way thinkers or something like that because no one wants to say middleist and I don't blame them. <laughs> I never wanted to say it either. So, uh, but that was anyway in the same topic of the centrist philosophy because the, the critical, you know, there are three levels of developing wisdom to realize the nature of reality of learning, the level of learning, the level of critical reflection, like philosophical meditation, in that sense, like Descartes' meditations. And then there's one-pointed meditation. And without the previous two stages, the one-pointed meditation will not necessarily lead someone to understanding. It will just go off somewhere and land on some point, and then it will not, it, it has to be, it's like in Zen, even in Zen, where they, some way, the way some people teach Zen, they try to discourage critical thinking. But actually, you have to develop a great doubt in Zen. And, and uh, the koan, for example, the public case or the, the riddle type case, is a way of developing tremendous doubt by critically thinking this way and that way and the other. And isn't that the thinking will get you completely to the understanding, but it brings you to the brink. It's necessary to bring you to the brink, even in Zen. And it's totally part of the Buddhist educational model, in fact. And um, so the Madhyamaka, or the centrist thought, is considered to be the indispensable prerequisite of the one-pointed meditation on reality itself, the discovery of self, which is the discovery of selflessness or emptiness, 
which is not a meditation really in a way on emptiness or selflessness. That would just lead one to a nihilistic misunderstanding. It's a meditation on non-emptiness and a meditation on the self. It's an attempt to discover the self, to discover what is not empty, to discover what seems to resist analysis. It's actually what the one point of meditation is in. And then, and then emptiness is discovered by failing to find that thing that one thinks is there, by seeing through it, by penetrating it type of idea. So, so, um, so that's, all, that's what I was going to do. I was going to translate it in the context of the meditation of vipassana, or critical insight, or what I call transcendent insight. Uh, which is what the the the, uh, the, the vipassana that's looking for selflessness by looking for the self and sustaining the inability to find that analysis resistant self. And uh, so I was happily heading off for India with, on a fellowship for a year to write my dissertation by translating that section, which is quite lengthy and very complicated. <clears throat> and um, my professor wanted me to do it, I think, because one great Japanese scholar, the late Gaijin Nagao, had, uh, who was the professor of Sanskrit in, in uh, Kyoto University in the past, and he had translated it into Japanese, which my professor was looking forward to having his help <laughs> himself. But when I got to New Jersey, my, my root teacher, the Venerable Geshe Wangyo, the Angelated Senemete, he said, oh no, don't do that one. He said, do the Lake Dange Lake Nimbo, this one, you know the essence of true eloquence. And um, I said, uh, oh, well, I didn't prepare for that. I didn't you know, study it. It's, I haven't looked at it. And he said, well, just never mind. You just do it. We'll take care of it. We'll, some people will help you. Just do that one. So then I happened to have a copy of it that His Holiness had given me when I was a monk, a little printing from Kalimpong, and a uh, little green done on Western paper. And so I happened to have that. And then I took it with me on the way to India. And I began to struggle with it in Spain, waiting for my visa, which was six months delayed. <laughs> so I had six months in the horrible condition of being in Mallorca <laughs> <laughs> for these six months while waiting to go to India during the time of the Bangladesh war, etc. because Indira Gandhi was annoyed with America and with Kissinger and Nixon and this and that. So she was holding up American scholars' visas. and. Um, and we were, so we were stuck in this paradise, waiting to go and sweat. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, I was, and I was stationed by the government in Shantiniketan, near, near Calcutta, where they were beheading people, the Naxalite. There was a really bad scene there at that time. And uh, so we were eagerly waiting our visa to go and get beheaded. Anyway. I began to read the book in Tibetan and try to begin to do a draft of translating it. And I just, I just couldn't, you know, I, it was really difficult. It's a very difficult book. It's known as the Dzongkapa's Iron Bow, Chakshu, in, in some circles, meaning, you know, a kind of a bow no one can bend. It's very, very difficult. And when I told His Holiness and other people that I was translating that as my dissertation project and st doing a study of it, they all like fainted and they like, what's the matter with you? You know, like, how are you presuming to do that? And I would just blame Geshe-la. I would say, well, he, <laughs> my teacher ordered me to do it. I, I don't know what to say. You know? <laughs> and, um, and, um, and so then they would kind of relent. And actually His Holiness said it was his favorite book of, of Tibetan philosophy, of, uh, of centrist philosophy. And that um, he, um, he then helped me by going over that volume, the, the edition that I had, and showing me all the mistakes, misprints, you know, that were in it, that he from his own copy, and then he assigned me Taratoku to teach me, to to read it, you know, and then I was I slowly worked on it, and then but it took me uh, 12 years actually. I had to work on it before I kind of got through it. Very complicated, look because his sentences are very long and his thought is very subtle. And then the story that I found out about it, which is quite marvelous, which I tell in the introduction to the book, is that when he was writing, when, when Jaden Muchi was writing the thing I was originally supposed to translate for my dissertation, which subsequently has been done by the very nice Elizabeth Knapper, um, uh, he was procrastinating about it, Don Kappa was. He was like, that was around 1402, I think, that he wrote uh, Lemrim. 
And he was like, oh, my may I shouldn't bother with this. And then Manjushri appeared to him as off, uh, he was always seeing Manjushri in those days. And Manjushri said, what's your problem? What's the writer's block? What's going on, you know? And so Dzongkhapa said, well, you know, it's so complicated and so, do I really, who's really ever going to read this? I mean, it's useless, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then Manjushri scolded him very strongly saying, how are you to know how many people are smart enough to, and you know, deep enough to really cope with this? And like, you definitely should do it. What is this? You know, you don't know what, who's going to read what, and then in the future you don't know who's going to read it. So you get busy and you write that. And then, uh, and give him a big scold. Manjushri used to scold him a lot, and, um, and then to encourage him, he somehow vouchsafed him a vision where Tsongkhapa saw in the sky, in the place he was working on the Lamrim, which I think was Retting Monastery, Atisha's uh, disciples founded monastery, Dom Dombas Monastery. Um, he saw from where he was, his, his writing stu stu study, he saw in the sky the 20 emptinesses written in golden letters. Silver, I'm sorry, silver letters, silver letters. So silver Sanskrit letters, the 20 emptinesses. But in Sanskrit, not Tibetan. So that was kind of cheery. He would get up in the morning, look out the sky, and see these silver letters out there of emptiness of everything, you know. So then he went ahead and he wrote that. And then it said in 1407, when he came back, he wrote this when he was writing his commentary on the Nagarjuna's great book called Wisdom, the, which people wrongly call the, the root verses, the Madhyamaka Karikas, the root verses on the Madhyamaka, which is just the subtitle. The title of the book is The Wisdom. Wisdom, it even says, you know, Pranya Nama Mula Madhyamaka Karika. The Mula Madhyamaka Karika is a subtitle, you know, like a descriptive title. And the main, it's just wisdom is what it's called that book. And when he was doing that, the complexities in the first chapter where Nagarjuna is rejecting causation, which is a huge thing to do, showing the unworkability of ordinary causation, analyzing causation until it dissolves under analysis, you could say. Since as you know, since you're all Buddhist scholars, Buddha's great discovery was causation, and, the, but, and also the cessation of causes. You know, Om Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava Hetun Tisham Tathagata Hi Abadat Tisham Chayo Nirodho and then their cessation, you know. That, or, you know, the summary of, of the Buddha's teaching that was just that he discovered causation. Because causation of the relative world is very powerful because it gives one a way of gaining leverage over the events of the relative world and improving things that, ha that are good by creating good causes and and uh, reducing things that are evil and bad and painful by getting rid of negative causes. So that was great discovery, but of course the final insight of the Buddha was nirvana, which is the cessation of causation, or the realization of, you know, an uncaused, you know, uncreated, you know, original condition and reality of things, which is uncaused and uncreated, you know, nirvana itself, you know, freedom as the nature of things, you know, the uncreated nature of things. Right? The deathless, as the Buddha called it. Right? You ready for that, Tom? <laughs> My old friend Tom is here. Tom Griffin. Actually, it was in your room that I had a weird former life recall in 1958. In your dorm room at Harvard, you and Teddy Holstrom. And I was watching the David Susskind show <laughs> on your TV, which you had one in that room. And it was a debate, philosophical kind of program, and I was very frustrated that I, could, I was shouting at the TV. <laughs> you guys, I guess, were trying to do your homework, or you were passed out sleeping, or you were partying. I don't know what you were doing. It was the spring of 58, you know, and, and uh, then I suddenly realized, oh, that must be like what it must be like when you're dead. You can't, you try to communicate to people, and they don't see you, you know, they can't, they can't, uh, it doesn't register, you know. That was in your dorm room. <laughs> 1958, how many years ago was that? Back away. Back away. <laughs> anyway, okay, I'm sorry to digress. A sign of age, you know. So, so, um, so then I did this, you know, and uh, it's just really great. And, the, and even the very first verse, you know, 
The first is reverence to the Guru Manju Gosha. And in this handout that you have, that, uh, that Tashi did the whole handout, you can read the, the, as an appendix the introduction, the, the prologue, if you will, to the, my commentary on it, where I just, it's a commentary on who is Manjushri. And in that, I kind of talk about, uh, I, which I'm very pleased with, actually. The one thing, I was really looking at this, this at, at supper, and I, I love this sentence. My editor at the Princeton Press hated it. And she was like, but then all of the scholars that, she, that they used as referees, they said, oh, you have to publish this book. But she really didn't like this. I, I say, first, the essence of true eloquence. In other words, I'm saying, what is the audience of this book? You know? He said, if the original author felt diffidence, here I'm referring to the Tsongkhapa story I just told you, about the work's usefulness in his times, with the very many great Tibetan scholars that were around him in Tsongkhapa's time in the early 15th century, during the time of the global renaissance that was generated also in Tibet, how much more should I be discouraged by the enormity of the task of making these insights available to a modern audience? Indeed, the question must be faced, just what is the audience of this book? So then I say, the essence of true eloquence is a work of philosophy, and hence a communication to philosophers. Actually, at the time, I was still at Amherst College. And the, about two years after I got to Amherst College, the Department of Religion and Philosophy split. And there was then a religion department and philosophy department, although I didn't cause that to happen. <laughs> It was the personalities of the, some senior members. But then I did have a long problem with the chairman of the philosophy department, who became eventually a very good friend. But for a while, he was very freaked out because he had the idea in his mind that India, and therefore Tibet, could have no philosophy. That philosophy was only a Western thing, and it was all theology in India and Tibet, and it wasn't a critical reason. And then once I... Once I <laughs> And Amherst is a funny little college where every faculty member creating a new course presents that new course. It has to be read by an entire faculty meeting. And all faculty meetings are mandatory for all the faculty unless you're on leave. So 150 people, it's small faculty, it's small college, but still 150 people would vet everybody's course. So when I wrote a course, a text, a description of a course on Indian philosophy, this chairman got up and said, there's no Indian philosophy. It's just bullshit, he said. He was other people, you know, talking faculty meeting. It's just bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> it's quite hard like that. So then I said to him, and then people were sure that I was doomed in that college. But actually, he ended up, when he read this book, he had to eat his words, actually. But at the time, he said that. So I said, well, I'm sorry, uh, Bill. But in Indian philosophy, anyway, what I call Indian philosophy, you can put bullshit forward as the premise and then give another reason for the bullshit. Or you can have a certain premise and use bullshit as the reason. But you cannot prove the premise of bullshit by continuously repeating bullshit. <laughs> At least in Indian philosophy. I'm not sure if that works in the West. <laughs> so then the, the, they passed my course, of course. And then he, everyone thought he was going to reality. <laughs> but we became great friends, actually. And when he read this, he says to me, Bob, having read your stuff, I learned a lot more about Indian philosophy than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> that was his way of recanting, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so yeah, so it's a work, oh yes, I was reading that. So a work of philosophy, yeah. And hence a communication to philosophers in the true sense of the title as lovers of wisdom whose wisdom is their love. But where are today's philosophers to be found? Too many have almost forgotten, this one I like, I like this sentence, it was outrageous to me at the time. <laughs> Too many have almost forgotten that science and technology, with capital S and T, are mere children. That ageless father Philo and mother Sophia still must worry about their notions and their adventures that is, of the children, science, and technology. Thus, neglecting the parents, these philosophers who think that, you know, science and technology have taken over from philosophy, you know, 
and that philosophy is dead. You know, the great philosophers today, they all announce it's dead. You know, like Richard Rorty, male philosophy in the mirror of nature, metaphysics is over, Heidegger. Metaphysics means, doesn't mean woo-woo, you know, like aura reading or like going to Weiser's bookstore. Metaphysics means the philosophical branch that deals with the nature of reality. But philosophers have decided that's finished, there's no such thing, because we all know reality is matter, and scientists are measuring it all. And it's just mathematical measuring and, you know, matter, and there's no philosophy anymore. Philosophy is dead. There's the literary criticism, there's going to art galleries and writing art criticism. There's like political commentary and irony. What, what was the name of Richard Rorty's second book after Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature? Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity. That's right. Those are, that's all that's left for philosophers to do. They're kind of glorified like theater critics, you know, philosophers. Because there's nothing to say about reality. Scientists have a hold of reality, you know. A.O. Wilson, the Ant-Man, consilience. You know, it's all we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna control all of reality, and we've finally discovered that all of you guys are nothing but a bunch of brain deluded robots. Your brain makes you think you have a mind, and the soul even some really crazy ones think they have a soul, and but it's really your brain, and you know, instead of this, I should have up here like a. An image of a brain with a medulla oblongata and these things, and I point to that, and then you feel, oh yeah, and you feel your endorphins rising, and your your serotonin is flowing, and you're all cool. Which which is what they 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 claim, but luckily Thomas Nagel is still alive. You know, down here at NYU, he said that the attempt to explain reality as a function of material quanta is doomed to failure. It just can't ever work because it, it begins from the denial of what everybody knows, which is that they do have a mind and they do have a soul. You know? So anyway, I liked it. I'm sorry, but I liked it about Mother Sophia and Father Philo. You know, worrying about science and technology, going around destroying the world, thinking they know what's real, and they and even it's it's so silly because I met Henry Stapp recently. Some those of you who are science bugs know who that is very famous quantum physicist, and I was so delighted. He s gets up and announces, since 1927, mind came back, came roaring back, and, and most of my colleagues ever since and still now are in denial of it. Meaning that the quantum people, you know, Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, etc., they, this, the standard thing of quantum people is that they, they don't know what matter is. That matter disappears under analysis. And therefore mind, the mind of the person is engaged, is a, part, is a force in nature. The observer is there, it's not outside looking at an objectivity, a material objectivity that is just purely measured and everybody can measure with the same measure. And uh, even their own measurement is just brain activity. That's just a complete fantasy. In, in the attempt to get away from the responsibility for your mind, actually, for trying to take care of your mind. Anyway, I was really pleased with that because he's a very distinguished quantum physicist. And he actually said, and other quantum physicists there said also, some non-quantum, non-particle physicists who were there were going like, oh no, we don't do that, blah, blah, blah. And yes, he said, Einstein led a rebellion against that and tried to say, yes, there's a way in which we're going to connect classical, the classical and the post-classical physics. Uh, there'll be a way and we'll get electromagnetism to connect to gravity and blah, 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 and the, on the 11th dimension. All this completely cuckoo theology, basically. Untestable, empirically inaccessible mathematical theology, really, is what it is. Totally out of, and they're not trained as philosophers, and they don't know how to meditate, they don't have concentrate. And it's, uh, anyway, so on. Thus neglecting the parents, these philosophers become enthralled by the willful children. Their philosophy becomes a mere handmaiden of science, and is hard pressed even to cope with that rambunctious technology. They take comfort in assuming the role of technicians of language and other conceptual systems, servicing the theoretical software of the empirical experimenters whose work they assume to be really important as directly affecting physical reality. 
They constantly proclaim the end of philosophy or the end of metaphysics and devote much care to the history of this now obsolete pursuit, or that meaning philosophy. In fact, metaphysical thought is still very much in charge of the prevalent worldview. It seems at an end only because it has become stuck on materialism, which is a metaphysical decision. It has conceded final, quote, objective, unquote, reality to the, quote, given data, unquote, of the senses. In short, it has become dogmatic, and like other dogmatisms before it, it has little patience with heresies. In particular, it has eviscerated itself by completely devaluing the power and importance of the mind, losing sight of the role the understanding plays in the actual construction of, quote, reality, unquote. It has therefore ruled out in principle its own power, the power of philosophy to transform life, either individual or social. So anyway, I go on and on with that, and I come up with the four presuppositions for Western philosophers that make them perhaps unreceptive to the topic of wisdom, of transcendent wisdom, of emptiness. And then the four presuppositions that make Buddhist practitioners intolerant of it, actually. So I don't only challenge the Westerners, I also get after the Buddhists. And uh, I have these four, I like that. So you can read that yourself. Okay. So now where do we start with the actual text itself? We start with Manjushri, and I think I mentioned a little something about Manjushri. But you know, they're said to be the outer Manjushri is this being who is a Buddha and uh, who pretends to be a bodhisattva to get beings to ask questions of any Buddha that they see. Wherever a Buddha is, Manjushri will go there and say, really, would you mean that? What's the real meaning of that and this sort of thing? And, um, but the inner Manjushri actually is in every one of our minds. The inner Manjushri is the strange thing that the Buddha insisted that human beings have, which, it, which he found that he had, having been a spoiled brat prince and then a completely self-involved ascetic torturing himself, having done, gone to those two extremes, and then come to a middle way in that case between two extremes. <laughs> A central way where he he became a you know a, a sage a muni and uh, so he then just says that we have the ability to understand ourselves that's a big shock to you does anybody tell you you can fully understand yourself or the world where did you hear that anywhere I don't think so people often ask me why did you as a young boy um, get so interested in Buddhism. And after acknowledging that I was suffering from a case of adolescent megalomania, megalomaniacal omniscience, <laughs> I say that I was annoyed by people saying on two directions that you can't understand yourself and you therefore have to depend on their authority. And the one is the religious direction, where we are just these ignorant, sinful beings, and there's, there's a God that knows everything, but doesn't, didn't decide to tell us about it, and actually made us to be unable to understand it, and just have blind faith. And then on the other side, the scientists, they're going to understand this piece and that piece of this and that function or thing, but any scientist who says, they, Eureka, I fully understand everything, of course, they, they kick them out, they give them some serotonin uptake inhibiting <laughs> drug. You calm them down because you're not allowed to understand. Only a deluded and insane person would understand the world. And whereas Buddha said, I do understand the world. Isn't that great? Although our English word understand even shows the backwardness of our culture in a way. Why should intuitive experience of the reality of something be called understanding? You're standing under it? What do you stand under? You stand under some sort of order from above, don't you? It's that authority thing, understanding. Oh yes, I understand. It's like meaning obey. It means like somehow someone tells you and you, oh, okay, yes, right, got it. But that's not understanding. That's just receiving obediently a formulation from authority, right? Understanding. In Sanskrit, and Tibetan, therefore, and other thing, the words for understanding are words from the verb, mostly are words from the verb to see or to go. 
And so that like when you understand something, you go into another world, a world of, that is newly understood by you as something different from what you thought it was, when you have a, an insight about it. We do have words like insight and things like that, which are great. Intuition we have. But, um, but still, understanding is a powerful word in our language, so we have to use it. But it has a, its etymology gives us a sort of clue about how dependent on authority we are. Whereas our inner manushri, inner, inner manjushri, is our own ability to for understand for ourselves. To be critical of what we're told, to be even critical of what we think based on what we've heard, and to really grapple with things and, and investigate them critically and then understand them at the deepest level. And the, the deepest level of understanding, what is that? Like, it's experiential in a certain way. It's where the boundary between subject and object come, becomes fluid. You, in a way, you sort of really understand something by merging with it in a certain way. You know, like the great poet Basho, he said, if you want to write a poem about the pine tree, you have to become the pine tree. And then the pine tree will express its essence through you. you know, wonderful poetic idea. So uh, the Buddha, of course, was from the point of view of some levels of philosophy, he was, you know, he, he, what he understood was a little bit unhelpful in the following sense. In the following sense, he said, oh, he said, profound, peaceful, sabshi turtle ursal dumaje, ursal turtle dumaje. Uh, you know, luminous, uh, cell or, or transparent, actually. Profound, peaceful, transparent might be better than luminous. Um, un unelaborated and uncreated. Like an elixir, like a deathless elixir is this reality I have found, he says. He uses the word find, I have found. Experienced, I think, in that sense. And then he said, but whoever I tell about it, they will not understand. So maybe, or they won't get it, literally. Maybe I shouldn't say understand now. Self-conscious about the word. They won't get it. So I'm going to not speak, and I'm going to stay in the, in the forest here. I'm going to stay alone in, the, in retreat. He said, he said a word like that, in the, in the, at least in the Sanskrit and Tibetan tradition. That's what he said. So, I mean, but we know that ourselves, don't we? I mean, not about nirvana only. When you ha eat an apple, when you eat an apple, you, you cannot describe in words what has happened. You can say, I ate an apple. That doesn't do justice to this crunch and the, you know, the, the substance, the fiber, you know, the juices, especially a good apple. It doesn't, you know, there's something inexpressible about any experience, right? We know that. But still, I ate an apple, it was a delicious apple, so we have our different ways, you know. Oh, is she does, nay, we go like, oh, it was delicious. <laughs> and we can exclaim things, but we don't pretend to capture that experience with those words. So in the very same thing, he said, you know, this, this understanding, the understanding of the nature of reality, Reality is inconceivable, unthinkable, inexpressible. It's beyond expression. He said, beyond words, he said. And then he proceeded, then of course he was only being coy about how he was going to stay on retreat. He was waiting for the gods to invite him, actually. You know, he was waiting for the promoter, who turned out to be the god Brahma, who came and said, come on, go tell human beings. Brahma, the god, the creator god of India at the time, was particularly anxious that the Buddha tell people and give them the teachings of how to understand what the reality that he understood. Because he wanted people to know that when horrible things happened to them, it wasn't his fault. And if they think he created everything, naturally people get mad and shake their fist at God, right? When the real tragedy strikes them, don't they? And God doesn't like that. He likes worship vibes, apparently. He enjoys that. But he doesn't like Hatred vibes. It's like when the president's, you know, positive polls go down into the 30s, his hair gets a little grayer every day. You know, he looks like, uh. <laughs> And the dumb ones go bomb somebody to try to get a little bit of a boost, you know. 
smart ones wait and buy their time like the current, our current one. Gives the loonies some more rope. So, <clears throat> so, so, but then he did talk, and then the word is really important. And, you know, the whole of the Buddhist philosophy, which is Buddhist science, philosophy is science. You know, materialist philosophers here, materialist scientists here are called in basic Western terminology, natural philosophers. That's where materialist science came from, from the branch of philosophy called natural philosophy. The very wonderful observation of things as you can see them in matter. But the Buddha as scientist, which I consider him the greatest of, human, of scientists on the, our planet, he predicted 25, 600 years ago what Henry Stapp announced at the conference I was at the other day and what Niels Bohr and Heisenberg announced which is the infinite divisibility of matter. That atoms fall apart, even atoms, which means indivisible in Greek, I believe, atom, correct me if someone knows Greek better, I don't really know it properly, but I believe atom means indivisible, and it's supposed to be that hard thing that doesn't dissolve, it, can't, it has no parts, so it's the sort of building block of reality. Well, he predicted, he said, it, there is no such thing. Everything dissolves completely. When you completely you go into it, nothing does not dissolve under analysis. Or rather, even nothing dissolves under analysis. <laughs> nothing is easy to dissolve under analysis because it isn't there. So that's very easy. There is no nothing. You know that well, ahead of time. And uh, that's a scientific prediction. And the quantum people and high particle physics, high energy physics, they have verified that finally thousands of years later in the West. The yogis of India and other places verified it long before. As a, sci as a scientific thing in the sense of knowing of reality thing, not just as a faith thing or a believing thing, as an experiential thing. When people said to Buddha, why, how, on what basis, what's your evidence that atoms are infinitely divisible? He said, I saw through them. And that, how can you see an atom? You wonder, right? We think we can't. We need a microscope. You need like even what those the, the Higgs boson and things that they find. They just find things shattering, and then they find evidence, trace evidence of the of, after things explode that they existed. They don't even see anything, even with their machines. So how could he mentally see atoms? Well, your mind is made of atoms, isn't it? The optic nerve with which you see is a bunch of atomic processes if you're seeing it on that level of magnification. So if you become completely self-aware by slowing down your awareness where it is aware of everything that itself is doing, you're then fun you can go down to function on your machine language level, let's say, and possibly even deeper, actually. I, I believe even deeper to a place where there are no atoms. This, I've been lately doing uh, editing a translation of the Kala Chakra Tantra and its commentary, stainless light. And they're making a huge fuss about how a Buddha's body is non-atomic. Mr. and Mrs. Kalachakra, that is, there's male and female versions. Their bodies are not atomic because they couldn't do what Buddhas do if they had atomic, of course, atomic bodies. And it, it, in a way, that means that there's a level of energy that is too subtle to be called either material, and then once there's no material, in a way it doesn't really mean anything to say mental. So, but in a way they prefer to say mental. But that's a really interesting thing. I've been, you know, it's very interesting. Anyway, we'll get back, I'll come back to it later in later talk. So, this first verse, Shambhu, Megavahana, Hiranyagarbha, Anangapati, Damodara, the other gods, all puffed up with self-infatuation, they roar their lordship over the world. You know, gods, gods can be forgiven for thinking that they are super duper. You know, <laughs> they are. You know, they are. They're really Shambhu is Shiva. You know, Shambhu, Megavahana is Indra. You know, the one who rides the clouds. You know, which can be a name for his elephant. Hiranyagarbha is Brahma. You know, the golden egg, golden womb. Anangapati is the bodiless lord, that's uh, Kama, 
the god of passion, Cupid, you know, and Damodara is Vishnu, big belly, and the other gods. They roar their lordship o'er the worlds, and yet before the vision of his body, they pale like fireflies in the sun. Said a piece of devotional thing. Then down they bow their sparkling diadems in reverence to the lotuses of his feet. I pay homage to that Lord of Sages, the God of all the gods. So I was so shocked to read this. This is there are Indian Sanskrit poems like this from from the Sanskrit Indian Buddhists. My favorite one is in. I should have looked that up for you because I don't ever remember the whole thing. But it says. Uh, May the pleasure that the gods feel when they behold the jeweling luster of the jewels in their crown diadems reflected in the toenails of the Buddha as they bow down to his feet. May the pleasure that the gods feel in that moment be your prosperity and good fortune. It's like a Wonderful verse, Sanskrit verse. You know, they're bowing and they're because they're feeling humbled by this being. And the reason that the Buddha does that, gods are, you know, the gods are not humbled by other gods. They, they take each other on, you know, they're like endless universes of them. But when they, the Buddha is a being that is them at the same time, you know. You meet someone who is, who's not someone opposite you, in other words. A Buddha is a being who identifies with you completely as much as with himself. Can you imagine that? Like if you look at each other or look at me, I look at you. We are looking out of our skin at each other, right? And you're over there and I'm over here and we're different. There's the boundaries between us, right? And we're used to meeting people like that and we kind of reach, we're like, you know, my wife always says we're human beings are like snails, you know. <laughs> You kind of reach out, that soft part comes out, and like little horns, and make sure it's safe, and shakes hands or something, you know. Looks at someone and looks away, you know. You know, and we're like that, we're in our shells. And so, but a Buddha, by definition, and, and the very other beings are to a certain degrees who are in the direction of Buddhas, it's a gradual process, they completely identify with everything, if you could imagine that. Well, you have to imagine that. Like, for example, you can look at your own hand. And yet you sort of feel you're in your hand, right? But yet it's a thing opposite you. You see it over there. Like, you know, it's not sort of out of my sense bundle in the same way. My skin is there, my touch sense. But still, my main facial sense bundle is sort of, this is outside its boundary. So at the same time, I see my hand as something other than me. And yet, I'm also inhabiting it in a certain way in a way, right? Because I'm identifying me as being sort of my thinking and my seeing and my whatever, you know, my judgments. And so imagine if you looked at another person and you felt you were that other person in the same way as you feel your hand. In one way they're sort of outside, but they're also you. So then expand that identification. Now, everyone's been in love. There's a few honeymooners around who are still there <laughs> in an advanced age now and then. And in those times, then they've learned to identify with another, and a parent, with a child, and so forth. You know, small, especially the infant, when they're, they're still producing only mother's gold. They're not that repulsive, they don't have a repulsive side at that time. And so, um, you know, we, we have that ability to expand our sense of identity and identify with others. So the Buddha identifies completely with every other being. So when the person meets such a being, they feel different. Suddenly there's their, the sense of confrontation is, is diminished. I guess I can, I, I guess it's explainable if you think in the Buddha's biography, one of his miracles that he did with his father. His father requested him at some point. He'd become kind of a student, etc., etc. But the father was never completely happy with the Buddha in a way because he, he would tend to think, although eventually he became an arhat. But I think he did after that miracle. He was never completely happy that Buddha didn't conquer the world, you know. It had been predicted Buddha could have conquered the world, been a world emperor, you know, if he didn't go the path of being a Buddha. And so he was a king, the father, you know, like, hey, you know, family business, <laughs> I have a world empire, how great. And he felt a little disappointed always, you know. So one day when he asked the Buddha for a miracle in the one Buddha Sutra, one story, the biography, 
Buddhas did this thing where two Buddhas came out of his heart, and then two out of their heart, and two out of their heart, and like a like rapid, rapid duplication like that, you know, exponential, until finally the father and everyone present in the audience felt, felt every sort of subatomic part of themselves was just Buddhas. You know, like every, there was like Buddha in every like poor hair or something, you know, they, they were just, everything was made of Buddhas, little Buddhas, you know. And the father was like, I'm Buddha, you know, I'm, I'm filled with Buddhas. And this Buddha, this Shakyamuni Buddha. So he said to he said after he, when he did that, he then said to his father, he said, well, dad, I know you've been disappointed that I didn't conquer the world, but I'm pretty much all over it, wouldn't you say? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the father, it's just a, it, it, it sort of shows the, the miracle, it's presented as a miracle, but it shows the idea of people, in that case consciously, but otherwise subliminally, suddenly feeling they are enfolded within this blissful presence, basically. There's no duality between them and the person that they're looking at, that they thought was a body outside of them, something like that. And then that made the father happy. Apparently, he became an arhat, attained nirvana. meaning that he himself expanded to adopt an identity with all beings. So, so that's that one. Uh, and I was shocked when I first translated, like, what's he doing with the gods doing this, you know? But, but that's the thing, you see. The Buddha is like Manjushri. Manjushri is your own genius. It isn't like, oh, I'm a great Manjushri, or I'm a great Buddha, and you guys just got to listen to me or something like that. It's like you have Buddha and Manjushri in your mind when you exercise your mind and you learn and you develop criticism toward your own delusive, rigid thoughts and identifications and so forth. And you, can, you have the ability to break through them all and really merge experientially with the true nature of reality. And encouragement, the, the deeper encouragement of the Buddha is that that true nature of reality is actually nirvana. It is actually the third noble truth. It is bliss. So the true nature of reality is not something to be afraid of. It's not like, I don't want to know the true nature of reality. No, no I want to just stay myself, you know. Bob Thurman, like, live uptown or whatever, you know, on the west side. No. <laughs> reality is not, not bad. Unreality is actually the problem. Even if we temporarily feel secure in it, the unreality of our self versus the universe structure is actually hopeless. We can never really control, cope with, deal with this universe as long as we are experiencing ourselves as separate from it. And contrary to what the materialists assure you, based on zero evidence, you don't get out of it just by being dead. Or rather, by them asserting that you don't really exist. Because you're just a brain. And your sort of sense of a continuum of continuity of consciousness is not real. It's a, it's a delusion. And your, you know, your reality is when you're deep asleep. So all you have to do is just fall permanently asleep and you'll be cool. That's, they have no evidence to assure us of that whatsoever. Who has come back from being nothing and reported that it's a safe place for everyone to go to just by dying? Or, or poor Robin, what did he do? He tied a belt around his neck or some weird thing. That doesn't mean he got into a safe place. He should have known. He was in that movie, What Dreams May Come. Did you ever see that movie? He went and saved that, his, that lady from Catholic hell. <laughs> Remember that movie? I really liked that movie. And then he went down all these weird things. Robin Williams, he went down there. He cracked jokes and people were relaxed in hell. In hell. Anyway, never mind. Mind a bit more. Okay, so then he goes on to, you know, Maitreya and Manjugosha. Manjugosha is Manjushri again. Maitreya is, that, is, a, is an image in that statue, that golden statue in the back of the room, there, or in the front of the room there. It's supposed to be the next Buddha. Maitreya, we're waiting for him for a few thousand years. But apparently he's present now, very active among us, in the form of dogs, or pets. He likes to emanate amongst human beings as dogs. Maitreya does. Because dogs, do you have a dog? Oh, 
Well, you should. <laughs> you don't like, or you have cats maybe. Oh, no, no, oh, but it extends your life, there are studies. If you have a pet, it extends your life. It does. It calms you down, you can talk to it, you can tell your trouble. You pet it, it comes up like, <laughs> who else comes up when you come in the door wiggling their rear end and going <laughs> like this? <laughs> well, where are you going to find a human like that? <laughs> Don't you? Oh, never mind, that's a joke. So, okay, so, anyway, that's Maitreya. Maitreya and Mandrugosha, vast oceans. Maitreya comes from Mater, Mother, Mitra, friend, and it means a loving kindness and love, you know. The loving one, you know. And they say when Maitreya comes to the planet as a Buddha, the planet is in much better condition. There's no wars and no fanatics and no crazy people, less crazy people. And people much more easily attain enlightenment. He has a much easier time than Shakyamuni did, who comes during this time of special violence and difficulties and short lifespans and a lot of diseases and things, according to the Buddhist thing. Anyway, vast oceans, treasuries of jewels of eloquence, rippling with mighty waves of enlightened deeds, hard to fathom in their depths of wisdom, hard to measure in their great expanse of love. So that's really nice. Those are kind of the two angels of... Um, actually, in the chapel here in, in Tibet House, tr as traditional in Tibetan, um, you know, thing, uh, any institution that Tibetans have, they have a little chapel somewhere, in the office even, you know, in the treasury office or something, they'd have a chapel. And then usually on the two sides of Shakyamuni Buddha would be Maitreya on the right and uh, Manjushri on the left. But when we came here, when we built this one, His Holiness asked us to put a Sangha on the right and Nagarjuna on the left, which are the human ve uh, vehicles or, or channels of the teachings of Maitreya and Nagarjuna. So then next you have them here, Nagarjuna and Asanga. I bow my head to the feet of Nagarjuna and Asanga, who pioneered the ways for champions of philosophy, with two interpretations of Sugata's sacred discourse, and made that, that Sugata is the name of Buddha, Sukham Gata means one who has become blissful, and made that superb doctrine of that victor shine like sunlight, sunlight throughout the triple world. So now, a lot of what we're going to deal with here, the two main protagonists actually are Asanga and, and Nagarjuna. And uh, Nagarjuna is said, because there are said to be these two elements in the Bodhisattva path, the profound view element and the magnificent vision element. Or I'm sorry, magnificent deeds, not vision, magnificent deeds element, that's right. So the view and the deeds, you know. And Asanga is channels from Maitreya, the magnificent deeds side, and the Nagarjuna channels the profound view. And in this, uh, you know, just in the broader stroke preview, in this uh, essence of true eloquence, uh, the two major Mahayana schools of thought are traveled through, you could say, in their gradations. The Tibetan educational tradition in philosophy and in enlightenment, therefore, is extraordinary, the curriculum. It really is remarkable. Why? Because, let's say, the most ignorant person, the unreflective common person, let's say, who just thinks that the world is the way it is out there, and whatever culture, however they're acculturated, their reaction to it is just absolute reality kind of, things are just exactly what they seem to be, and there's no reflection about that. Uh, that person has a kind of sense, uh, solidifies things around them in a certain way, like that pillar, well, there's a sociological term that I love, that pillar right there has a sense, it has in it a sense of the massive facticity of its pillarness. <laughs> I know it's a funny word, but if you see the pillar, you, in addition to seeing the pillar, you see like its sense of solidity and its strength and its impenetrability and as if it really corresponds to one's concept of a pillar. Do you know? It really seems like that, or the floor or something, you know? We know from scientists with the particle physics that you know, x-rays can go through the pillar, you know. 
a nuclear bomb can cause its supposed atoms at the level of having atoms to completely explode and release the energy of the strong forces in them that seem to hold their structure into so hold them into some solidity of structure and they can become they can detonate even and become a nuclear thermonuclear reaction that pillar Right? If someone dropped an A-bomb here, that pillar would go <laughs> and turn into flame. And, um, and uh, so we, we know that sort of thing, but still, to us, it's just an absolutely a pillar. You know? Right? So that's the, that, at that level, that's the person who's just basically completely stuck in whatever world they are given by their culture and their sense organs and their and their fellows and their language, something like that. Then at the high end, at the opposite end of that, is a Buddha, supposedly. I mean, I'm, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not one, and I wouldn't even know for sure if I met one, since you apparently takes a Buddha to know Buddha. <laughs> really, they say. So, I, but, but to me it makes sense that there, there, uh, there is this gamut from the sort of most solid sort of entity, mental entity, to the most open mental entity. The reason that it makes sense to me is because of the fact of infinite continuity making sense to me. That there's no end of anything and no beginning of anything, ultimately. Things just endlessly change. So if that's the case, and if the best way of being is to be one with everything, in a blissful sense, seeing it through, its, through being aware of its bliss, that would be the best. Wouldn't that be the happy ending of the universe? Wouldn't it not be? I mean, you, you, you like to be happy, every one of you, I hope. There might be some people here, occasional existentialist comes in and says, I like my suffering. I'm keeping it. Don't uh, give me that la la stuff. It's what makes me real. It makes my art. You know, <laughs> there are those people. <laughs> and but most of us like to be happy and have a good time. Come on. <laughs> Look at you, mostly smiling. A few serious faces, Michael. Stop that serious face. Or maybe you're snoozing. That's okay then. But, so we all do want that. So the idea of being permanently and completely happy and every, everyone else, experiencing everyone else as permanently and completely happy by seeing through the illusion of time and seeing those even who think they're suffering, seeing how they will be able to unravel that mistaken thought, which must be a Buddha's vision or, or a Buddha to become one would be abandoning beings in suffering, which he promised never to do. So, it makes sense to me, that's all. It's not that I know that for a fact. Could be wrong, you know? Could be a mistake. Maybe it's just misery forever, I don't know. Could be wrong. Have to try it to find out. <laughs> however, however, if that's the case, then one's view, what they call your vision of what the world is, has a kind of gamut from most closed, just sort of a vic complete victim of your circumstances, helplessly controlled by your circumstances, by considering them to be the only inevitable reality, and the other direction being completely free to make circumstances for the best of all possible worlds, for the best of all beings in the world, out of feeling the best you could possibly feel in everything, not just in some enclosed embodiment. You know, the, a Buddha is not in, in an enclosed embodiment. A Buddha has, they say, three bodies in the Mahayana, a Dharmakaya, a body of reality. So all reality is your body. But then when you all reality is your body, you feel that it's a bliss to do that. That's called Sambhogakaya, a body of total bliss. Sambhoga, Bhoga means enjoyment. And some means total, some boga. And, and then when you're in that some boga state, you, you are one with every energy. You enjoy being one with every energy. And therefore, when you encounter a being who has knotted up their energy so as to feel 
alienated and isolated and oppressed and frightened and or aggressive and angry and so forth and incomplete and greedy and so forth then you naturally manifest out of your bliss whatever it is that might help them best unravel that that er that erroneous stance of theirs since you see them as sort of part of a bliss field and you see them fighting and creating stress for themselves failing to I mean, <laughs> failing to really succeed in creating real stress for themselves but doing their best to do so and so so uh, so then in between there are there's what what I what there's a there's a ladder there first there's outside of the, those who are, are are thought of as outside of the refuge of the dharma the reality and the teaching of reality so outside of that teaching but within them there are realists nominalists uh, idealists and some kind of relativist or something and nihilists there's total nihilists and there's absolutists definitely then inside the what's called the insider which was the original word for a buddhist just an insider meaning inside the refuge of buddha dharma sangha the three jewels of buddhism what they call the three rare and precious things there's the critical realists they're 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 not able they, they don't think they, if they jump toward emptiness too strongly they would become nihilistic and because they're based they're too concretized in a way in their way they their wiring let's say their philosophical wiring and their vision then there's critical nominalists then there's critical idealists intersubjective and critical idealists and then there's critical relativists which is what the centrists are relativists in a good sense now in western philosophy relativist is a bad thing because Western philosophy really is real, really comes out of a matrix, uh, most world philosophies, but Western one more, more or less totally, comes out of a matrix of absolutists, what Buddhists would call absolutists. That is those who think that there's some absolute formula that, that you know, a dogma or formula that really is the real truth, you know, that it's absolutely this way or that way. You know, and, and they, and there's no, that's the, the truth, you know what I mean, capital T, they live and die over, and others, and they'll kill over, actually. And that, unfortunately, is a lot of human beings get into that. A human being is a very unusual being in that they really are very mental beings. What other being, which groundhog is going to go and die over being a communist, or a capitalist, or a Muslim, or a Christian, or, a, or whatever, an existentialist? I don't think so. Groundhog, it's, it's like coming out in the winter, sees Bill Murray and runs back in. <laughs> you know? So, but human has this incredible thing where our minds are so powerful that we come up with some, we have an experience and we interpret that as, <gasps> met the, I met a burning bush. <laughs> we met bushes, lady, they were presidents and they were burning with idiocy <laughs> and decep deceptions. <laughs> And they burned our country. That burning bush, oh, it must be the absolute. I got to do whatever it says. So the absolutist thing is, is a big deal. But there's an opposite of the absolutist, a nihilist. And they had, to, they had him in Buddha's time. And unfortunately, the philosopher scientists of our material scientists have become nihilists, really. They really have, in the ultimate sense. Relatively, they want to invent something, make a lot of money, and retire from MIT and found their own company and patent something. But, so they want to have a good time, which is lucky. But, ultimately, they're nothing, and it's meaningless and random, and they have all these theories to convince themselves that it all doesn't matter. Whatever it is, go for it. It doesn't matter. It's finished, and it never happened. That's total nihilism. Therefore, they are wrecking the planet, because the planet is not nothing. And it cannot be burned, and it cannot be filled with carbon, and it cannot be bombed and blown up, and all the stuff that they do. That they won't really turn off these machines. They claim to care, but they don't. It's in proof. Somebody gave me this shirt. Actually, somebody gave it to somebody else, and I stole it. Because <laughs> I'm coming on that Sunday. I'm coming down here. Finally, out of my ivory tower. Lazy professor. What? So. So, so there are these different stages, 
and realism, nominal, sort of roughly. I mean, we could. There's other names for it, but realism, nominalism, idealism, and relativism. So, oh yeah, this. So relativism, however, is a, is the centrist. It's the centrist between absolutism and nihilism. And the way nihilism is a kind of absolutism about nothingness, thinking of that as the final, ultimate thing. You see. You know, the, 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 the theist can be an absolutist theist. You know, God is all and all, and I'll just kill everybody who doesn't think so. You know, like, you know, the guys, those guys with the black flag running up and down in Iraq and Syria, you know, let's kill everybody. That's not bad, actually. <laughs> Four strains of live probiotics joining the microbiome community. So, uh, yeah, so the rel critical relativism, I call that the centrists are relativists. And relativism is something g is g good in the Tibetan view, in the, in the Indian view, in the Buddhist philosophical view. Because it's not absolutist, but it's not totally anything goes nihilist. It's like there are truths that are relative and valid within a certain perspective, even though they're not absolute. And, and then there are untru relative untruths. So the relative itself has truth and untruth. But all of them, in a way, from an absolute point of view, are untruth. Because the only truth is truthlessness. That's <laughs> emptiness means selflessness. They call it truthlessness sometimes. Meaning it's not, emptiness is not something you can cling to like an absolute. In a way, it is the absolute. And, it's, and it, in its absoluteness, it's empty of itself. And therefore, by being empty of itself, it makes the relative meaningful in, its, in, relative, in relative contexts, always in a context, always within a certain perspective. And therefore, love and goodness and, and kindness never, are never lost. They're never meaningless. They're never unnecessary. And similarly, the negative always has its consequence. So relativism is, is actually, we want somebody to relate to us. We, we, if we relate to things, the more we relate to things, the better we and the things will be. And that we will relate better, especially if we feel there's no way not to relate to them. Then we really want to make the relations really good, you could say. But I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you the parameters of the thing. So, so these are what, you know, the Dalai Lama likes to say, His Holiness likes to say all the time nowadays, and I'm so thrilled with it, that he is not a member of this or that Tibetan Buddhist sect, primarily, although different ones will claim him, and he's ecumenical about all of them. And, and he also, he, well, he is a Buddhist, but he's very uh, pluralistic about the Bern people. The Bern people, in Tibet are really like Buddhists, frankly, because they want to be Buddhas, but they don't want to be Shakyamuni Buddhas, they want to be Shenra Buddhas. They have a different Buddha, you know. But they do, they are Buddhists, really. And uh, they're, they're probably, so they're, he considers them the fifth school, main school of Buddhism. But in Tibet they're considered, we're not Buddhists, we're Bambos. But we want to be Buddhas. But we don't want to be Buddhas in relation to Shakyamuni. It's a funny thing. I like to say, Tibet is so Buddhist that even the non-Buddhists are Buddhists. <laughs> that, that's, I think, is, sums it up. You know. And then, he, and then the fifth Dalai Lama, even in the 17th century, he gave land to the Christian missionaries. He gave two parcels of land to two different kinds of Muslims, the ones from Kashmir and the ones from uh, from Qinghai, you know, the Uyghurs. And so he was very ecumenical. And the present Dalai Lama is very ecumenical to the materialists. He goes on about secular ethics and let's be secular and, and you know, he's always scolding me about being critical of, toward them. He doesn't like it when I do that. But I think he caters too much to them, personally. I confess. <laughs> he's just nice to them. He's nicer than me, but that's because he's enlightened. I'm not. Okay. So. Respectfully, I bow to the next verse. I bow to those master scholars, best heralds of the non-decline of Buddha's teaching, who upheld the two systems of the champions, that's Nagarjuna and Asanga, and opened the eyes of millions of geniuses. 
to the ornaments of the noble, it should be noble land of India, noly land, holy land of India, I'm sorry, it should be holy land of India, Arya Deva, brave Buddha Palita, Bhava Viveka, Chandra Kirti, Vasubandhu, Stiramati, Dignaga, Dharma Kirti. The Dalai Lama says there are 17 of these great pundits of Nalanda University, what he calls. The, here, Dhongabha lists 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. He lists 10 of them. And then there are seven more that the Dalai Lama has as a collection of the greatest of the Indian pundits, you know. The pundit there doesn't mean like pundits on TV. It means real geniuses, you know, great professors of that university who are also great yogis and great sages and, and saints also as well, all enlightened people. Dignaga and Dharmakirti were great logicians, epistemologists. They were kind of, they, they straddled the, the bound, philosophical boundary between nominalists and idealists, as did Siramati and Vasubandhu. Eventually, Vasubandhu was originally a, a Theravada uh, realist, critical realist, who then became an idealist. Chandrakirti was a centrist, Bhavaveka was a centrist, and Buddhapalita and Aryadeva were centrists. Although, in a way, all of them could write, wrote at different levels philosophically, because in the curriculum, you shouldn't jump yourself beyond where you're sort of capable of coping philosophically. It's like a gradual, they don't teach history of philosophy like in the West, because they don't think philosophy is dead in the Buddhist uh, university curriculum, which the Tibetans still have alive in Drebung, Gandhansera, and other, other institutions. They're not just monasteries, they're monastic universities, and they keep this curriculum alive. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to move from yourself being a kind of naive realist, thinking just everything is real, the way I see it, and developing more and more critical insight and more vipassana about it and, and being critical of different ways of describing it and seeing it deeper and deeper and then move to where you realize that your language is constructing how you see things and your images and your concepts and then when that when you begin to re that becomes more strong for you you then begin to realize that your mind is creating and you might become a, a intersubjective idealist not a solipsistic or subjective idealist thinking it's just all in your mind it's in your and other people's it's in the intersection of your and other people's minds the world and then finally you resurrect in a way the external object in the like a relativist does as a madhyamaka so there's as a centrist and so that's that's kind of the gamut of the of the worldview of worldview uh, identity transformation uh, you know that 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 um, that is the path you know and that's where the meditation is directed and and the meditations at all of the levels is valuable and it helps climb the levels but there's also always learning and there's always critical reflection and you know guiding the meditation and then one brings together a, a, a cultivated ability to focus on on a single topic without the mind wandering and then it gets deeper and deeper so that's 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 what this is all about you know and that's why the Dalai Lama says he is the heir of the 17 pundits of Nalanda. And he's the 18th pundit of Nalanda. And it's funny, the Indian government wants to rebuild in Nalanda. And they, but, they, but because of politics, they, they were directed by certain people to rebuild it without the Dalai Lama. And which means without the whole curriculum and the institutions, he's kept alive in exile and eventually will be rekindled in Tibet. Because they're there, the, all the Harvards and Yales and things of Tibet are still there. They were all torn down to some extent, but then they were somewhat rebuilt also uh, in the 80s, since the 80s, and then they've been in the stasis since the 90s and, and noughts. Again, with a new kind of cultural revolution that's been going on there by a Chinese crackdown. But they'll be come back into function, definitely. Kind of institutes of advanced studies. Now he talks about his himself, Tsongkhapa, and he, in 1398, when he was 41 years of age, actually when he was about 35, he was considered the greatest master in Tibet, actually, more or less, by everybody in all the different sects. He studied with people in all the different sects, and he was invited everywhere to teach. And then Manjushri said, hey, where are you going? 
you know, because he had learned to talk directly with Manjushri. He used to see him sitting like an orange guy sitting in a blue globe who would come like manifest in the room there and say, where, where do you think you're going? Oh, I'm going to go teach over at Yale. You know, they want me to come there for a semester. That's like, you know, Daichen Monastery or something. And when say, no, you're not. So what do you mean, I'm not? They invited me. Yeah, but you shouldn't be teaching yet. I mean, you can teach some book, but you, you, you know more than you think you know, and you're not ready to teach. You need to go on a long retreat and purify yourself. And I'm not answering any more questions. I answered all your questions. You know all the answers. But you're just not, they're not transforming you yet because you haven't taken them deep enough. You have to go on retreat and purify yourself of your karmic obscurations, he said to him. And you can take eight companions with you and get lost. Oh, no. And then some then Dungapa's colleagues were all mad. They thought he'd gone crazy and he was having hallucinations and, and that he, you know, he was like wanted on the faculty to go out and teach. And he's leaving and the people were really upset. And he disappeared. He went to this Olka Valley, beautiful place in, uh, in, in central Tibet called the Olka Valley with his eight friends. And he did all this, uh, he did 3,500,000 prostrations. Full prostration, three million, one hundred thousand each to each of the thirty-five Buddhas of compassion. He did a hundred, I don't know how many mandala offerings, and etc. There's a set of things that you do, like, and he did all those, and he meditated, and he reread and reread and reread all of these things, and then one morning, he had this dream, and in the dream he was in Maitreya's heaven called Tushita, in Tibetan it's Ganden, and and in that heaven, there are a bunch of self-indulgent gods, the Tushita gods, the satisfied gods. Tushita means satisfied or happy, joyful. Uh, but then there also is a Dharma center there where Buddhas who stay before they come to earth for a few thousand years, they stay there. And that's where Maitreya is supposed to be living now as head of that Dharma center. So he was there in the, in the Dharma garden of Maitreya in his dream. And there was Nagarjuna and Asanga and Dignaga and Buddha Palita and Chandrakirti and all his idols, you know, these great, great thinkers, these like champions, you know, the great pundits of Nalanda that the Dalai Lama talks about. And he was so excited and in the dream and he wanted to go and listen to their, and they were conversing about the centrism, critical centrism, relative, critical relativism. And then one of them, a tall one, sort of dark complexion from South India, whose name was Buddha Palita, he recognized, came up with a copy of, the, of his commentary on Nagarjuna's um, wisdom book, which Dungapa was reading in, in the daytime in his retreat cave in that place. He was in the a retreat from the retreat. He was up in a cave above on the mountain at 17, 18,000 feet. And uh, in, the, in what's called the Yamatung Cave. And, um, and then brought the commentary and touched his head with it in the dream. That's a blessing. And then Dzongkhapa woke up. And upon waking, he then took out that book in the 18th chapter, the first verse. And we started to look at Buddha commentary on that thing. And it was that verse in the 18th chapter where it says, the self is neither the same as the aggregates. Aggregates means the physical body, the sensational body, the conceptual body, the emotional body, and the consciousness body. You know, the five, five layers of the psychophysical processes, which is just a heuristic way of sort of seeing the different, the different degrees of subtlety, different layers of yourself as a being. And the, so the aggregates are, you know, the, the relative processes that, go, that are going on. And he read that line in Nagarjuna where it says, the self is not the same as the aggregates, nor as it, is it anything different from the aggregates. And his finger was on the page when he saw it, when he read that. And then he achieved what he considered like complete enlightenment. And this is what I really like. He said that it was the opposite of what he expected. The opposite. He said, now I, he didn't really say complete in life, he just said, now all the subtleties and all the, all the perplexities are gone, I completely got it. Then everybody else calls it enlightenment, mental enlightenment at least. 
in a tantric sense, there's, he had, there's a little more to go there with the body. But in the mind, he had completed it, completely done it. But then he said it was the opposite of what he expected. His reality was the opposite from what he would expected. I really like that. I didn't used to like it, but I like it. <laughs> I like it now. I hope, I think. It's like the big disappointment, in a way. But he was totally ecstatic. And then he immediately wrote The Essence of True Eloquence as a poem, which I translate in this book before the great, and it comes to be known later as Lake Shen Yimbo Chua, the smaller essence of true eloquence. And then the, the, the larger one that's also, it's called The Greater Essence of True Eloquence, which he wrote then, uh, that was in 1398, and he wrote that in 1407, so nine years later he wrote The Greater One, uh, when he was writing a commentary on that book of Nagarjuna's. And so this is, this is, then he says here, he, so he's, in a way he claims he got it straight, he understands. There have been many who did not realize that place, that means reality, this place, but he says that place. Although they strived, were not lowly in accomplishments from direct experience, were learned in the doctrine, and even dedicated themselves to the path of philosophy. And then the commentators say this refers to some of his predecessors, who he greatly respects. But he felt that none of them had gotten to that place. He did feel that. This place, that place. The place that he was surprised to get to. But I have seen it quite precisely by the grace of my guru, Savior Gosha. And I am, go that's Manju Gosha. And I am going to explain it from great love. Listen with reverence, you who aspire to peerlessness in philosophy, with the critical discrimination that realizes the thatness of the teaching. Thatness is another description for the that place for reality. Actually, I saw briefly a Star Trek film that I had never seen all the way through in the past on TV the other day. Uh, called, I think, The Rebellion or something. It was in one of the movies, and in which you know, the, they come to this place, this planet, where there are these rings that make everybody rejuvenated. And it's like a sort of hippie commune of these people who live there, and they're hundreds of years old, and they're young and vital and energized. And then some evil people are going to like extract the energy from the rings and destroy the planet and destroy the whole story and then he rebels, you know, I, I, you know. I, I, but then he, he falls in love with the lady who's 350 years old. She looks, she looks like a really delicious 45. <laughs> and, and he says, he says to her, you know, I'm attracted to older women, Picard does. <laughs> She's 350 years old. And, uh, but the, she does this thing where, at some point, sitting with her, she says, she says he's rushing ahead, he's a Star Trek officer, blah, blah, blah. You know, and of course, he saves them from being destroyed by these bad guys, eventually. But there's one point where she blows a, from a flower, and, and pollen comes out from the flower, and then everything sort of slows down. And he's like in this infinite moment. He has an experience of being an infinite moment. I don't know if you remember that. It was beautifully done. And, um, it's like Picard, it's like, really like that. So that's like thatness. That thatness means, the, the great mystic Meister Eckhart, I think he called it istigkeit in Germany, isness. You know, where suddenly the things are just inexpressibly amazing as they are. And in a way, they seem like perfect. Everything seems perfect. Without look, shaking your head. <laughs> You must have felt that sometime. We all have, I hope. And so there's that kind of moment like that, which is completely ungraspable and it's inconceivable, and usually it disappears, although Buddhahood is that, for, that, like that forever, actually. In the middle of even seeming mo motion, even, it's like that. It's all still. Motion is an illusion, as Nagarjuna points out in his second chapter. And, and, uh, so that's what thatness is, and then and there's two ways of experiencing that. There's thatness and there's suchness. Which and such means like that, but not exactly that. So the thatness is where the thing as it is is transcendent, and yet it's a thing, but it's also everything. 
and suchness is where the thing as it is disappears, kind of, and everything is there, you know. And you can only say it's like that. It's it's not actually itself. Or something. <laughs> Fatness and suchness. Anyway, they're very cool. So anyway, that's so that's what he's going to do in this great book, you know, that he writes. Now, in, uh, when I did it, I found these verses on this page. I put it just on one page because I have the Tibetan on this page. But it's, um, I was, if we do make that booklet, which I'm not sure we will, but I wrote like 250 pages just, just explaining these verses. I gave the biographies of these teachers. I gave Tsongkhapa's biography. I discussed Maitre Manjugosha. I talked about the different go Indian gods and what they were like. And then I talked about the history of why he's doing that. And just to give you a preview, since this is the first time, you know, one thing I discovered to my shock, only recently, I'm so naive myself and so ill-educated. <laughs> Mostly, you know, from Tsongkhapa, you know, in Tsongkhapa's biography, they say he did four great things, four great deeds. And none of them are this enlightenment. They don't call that a great deed. And uh, they don't um, call any of his writings or teachings a great deed. In a way, they just take them for granted, you could say. But the great deeds he did were one, in 1398 99, after this first ex this experience that he encodes in the lesser great, in the short uh, addresses of True Eloquence. He, w he went to a temple near his retreat place in a, in a ta little tiny town called Zingji at the north end of the Oka Valley. I visited there. It's kind of wrecked again now. Although I, with some people were working on it in the 80s when I was there. Or 90s when I was there. And uh, 93, I think I was there. And there was a famous statue of Maitreya there, which was known to talk to people. It's like a magical statue, you know, like a version of Guadalupe or something. And it was all fallen in disrepair, and there were birds nesting on its head, and there was, you know, bird poop dripping down its arms, and, and it was the roof was leaking. It was a total mess. And he and his eight followers didn't have any money. They'd been on retreat for years, but they did a puja to the god of wealth, and then a bunch of nomads and artists showed up and said, what can we do? And they started refurbishing that thing. And then there was a kind of amazing thing like you read about in the life of St. Francis, where everyone in the whole region saw visions in the sky all the time, you know, and they saw like choirs of angels and bodhisattvas and Buddhas. And so people came from all over and then they had a kind of festival of, re 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 you know, replenishing that image of Maitreya and a kind of celebration of the Maitreya, which in Buddhist history, is a famous thing because by celebrating Maitreya, the future Buddha, you're not going with the Kali Yuga idea, you know, the Indian idea that everything's going to the dogs, or the Republican idea that everything's going to the dogs and there's no point doing anything and it's all going to go to ruin and, you know, and might as well just like just escape to your own special island and play golf, you know. And when they, when in Buddhist movements in Buddhist history that have focused on Maitreya have been progressive and wanted to change things for the better and, and implement things and do things. In China, they used to, they're afraid of that actually, they used to, because they used to, there were a couple of Maitreyist revolutions actually. And even in, in Korea and Japan as well, in East Asia. And I never heard of one in India, but, um, or Tibet. But in a way, Tsongkhapa was revolutionary, not in overthrowing any kind of politics, but in a way, changing the medieval Tibetan society began with that movement, that Maitreyist movement, you could say, which is in, indicated by Tsongkhapa's first great deed. And then his second great deed was in 1401 and 2, two or three, two, three years later, he got together all the sects and the teachers, his own teachers, led by his own teachers from all the sects, and they, they had a summer uh, Vinaya festival the Vinaya being the rules of the monastics and the ethics for the lay people, and sort of, you know, got the Tibetan monks to stop drinking beer and stop having girlfriends and stop, you know, like re revive the ancient uh, monastic rule and make it, uh, make, uh, you know, make it more workable and live up to its original uh, prescriptions, you could say. 
and uh, also found, so that's the second great deed, so re reviving the monastic thing. And then the third great deed was the Manlam Chemel, where he made, he was given a lot of funding. Then from 02 to 09, he wrote this book and the Lamrim book and other books. And he taught a lot of huge assemblies and um, different princes and kings in Tibet of the time, which was kind of decentralized, regionalized. They brought great offerings and they wanted him to build a big monastery in honor of him. And he said, I don't want to build a monastery. There's a lot of good monasteries. So instead he spent all the money refurbishing Lhasa and all the temples and having all the paintings restored and conserved, sculptures, etc. And, uh, and then he threw a huge party at the New Year celebrating the two weeks of miracles in the Buddha's biography, Shakyamuni's biography, which happened always in the new moon under a certain star of the, of the first lunar month. And um, which became Manlam Chimba, the great prayer festival or the great miracle prayer festival. And uh, with the, our concert that we have in, um, in Carnegie Hall is our little tiny Peho resonance, you know, of that, uh, of that uh, event that happened then in Tibet fairly continuously except for a brief blockage of it in the late 16th century by a jealous king who stopped it for about 20 years and then the communists have stopped it. Otherwise that, conf that, that event goes, has gone on ever since 1409 when he did, that's his third great deed. And then his fourth great deed was, no, was not building Gandan Monastery. He lived in a retreat place in Gandan and people have settled around him and a monastery kind of evolved. But that's not considered his great deed. His great deed is he built a great hall in which to create three three-dimensional mandalas of three um, tantric mandalas, you know, because he felt they couldn't be out in the open, like in tent camp sort of thing. They had to be inside a hall so that people who didn't have a good attitude about it, they would be considered esoteric for the people who didn't have had a good attitude. And then I know what it's, that they, I don't know when they were destroyed or what happened, but they, they were, the main deities were the size of an eight-year-old boy. So that means these were gilded bronze, gilt bronze buildings where the central figure would be eight, the size of an eight-year-old that's like that high. So the building, if a building is like 40 cubits, meaning this forearm finger to elbow length of the central deity, or 60 cubits or whatever some of them are, that, those were really big, really big, like three-dimensional mandala, like that three-dimensional mandala there is, in the back, but that's like make like a little dollhouse. But these were obviously huge, a lot of gold, tremendous amount of gold. That was considered his fourth great deed. So the reason I'm mentioning that as a shortcut is note that those deeds have to do with history and society. And and so it was a huge impact. And then after that, everywhere with the Dalai Lama's leading it, the first Dalai Lama was one of one of his students. And then, then the, the next couple of hundred years, the Dalai Lamas kept leading this kind of movement and more and more people wanted into these universities and more and more people became monks and nuns and they were just, they were using these curriculum that came out of all these pundits of Nalanda and they were obviously getting results because they more and more wanted the opportunity to use it and there's and, and Tibet developed this what I consider unique society that I don't think any Tibetologists have really discovered except me and they just think I like Buddhism too much so I'm useless. And posthumously they might come to see, I call it a mass monastic society. There's, it's not a sociological category that we have. Because why? In Europe around the similar time, in the the Renaissance happened, but, uh, but before the Renaissance there was a time when the Cistercian movement, etc. They, they got up to be about 1600 to 2000 monasteries throughout Europe, some of them quite large. And so the monastic vocation gripped a lot of people and they genuinely went through a process of purifying the heart and becoming more loving and mild in a different way. Of course they had a few loony monks because they didn't have loony bins, so they would take care of people there. And the first hospitals grew out of that, actually, even in Europe. And so Europe kind of went toward that mass monastic, but then what happened? The Reformation. And, and the Reformation enabled the kings 
to crush that, those monastic orders and have no monasteries. So that all the manpower was available to the state. And, then, and, then, and therefore the states were highly militarized. And then they conquered, of course, the planet. And on, that, on the contrary, the Tibetans went the other direction. And the, the movement Dongkapa launched, which the Dalai Lamas pursued, continued to lead, monasticized Tibet so enormously that the, that the princes no longer had men, manpower for their militias and their armies. And therefore, in the late 16th century, they tried to crack down and squash down the movement. It had nothing to do with doctrine or, you know, Nyingma, Kaju, Sakya, nothing to do with that. It, that's, those are just names. They were all doing the same thing. They were all building more and more of these institutions because people wanted them. Because they were, when they were studied in this way, they would really get somewhere. And they'd change the quality of their existence. That's why people really, ultimately, schools fail if they don't deliver to people a better quality of life, they're going to fail. And these schools grew exponentially all over Tibet, creating this society that basically could only afford these huge monastic universities and could not afford an army, the surplus of the society. A society that only puts all its money into army cannot afford its universities, if you notice. And also the science and people in the universities work for the army. Where the Columbia, my, uh, not alma mater, but my place where I have worked for 30 years now, they started the atom bomb, you know. Started at Columbia. I don't know, 128th Street. <laughs> They're out there. <laughs> messing atoms in between, like, burgers. So, so therefore, okay, so it's a big thing, right? Now, I understood politically that there was some kind of oppression of it, but what I didn't know till recently in detail, where there were some people who vociferously disliked what Tsongkhapa came up with. And some of them were so rude as to say that the Manjushri that he was talking to was a demon posing as Manjushri, and that he really had the wrong idea. And, and, and it is a vein through Tibetan history of this kind of people. Not many, they're very much a minority, but they really were noisy. And they're still around, actually, you know, and some Westerners are into it. So I was trying to, just, as I said, I was just so ignorant of it, I couldn't imagine it, so I never really looked into it till lately. But then I think I know why. Why? Well, why did Tsongkhapa say that it was the opposite of what he expected? What would you expect if you had an enlightenment experience? What would you expect it to be like? For example, when you achieve the vision path, then there's, there's a, you know, the Theravada, Mahayana, all the forms of Buddhism have what they call five paths, what's called the path of preparation, path of application. And those two paths are where a person is a common person, in their, an alienated individual in sort of technical expression, which means the person really feels different from every other person. And then when you go from the path of application to the vision path, you become what they call an Arya or a noble person. And that's where you begin to develop a thing where you identify with others as equal to yourself. That's what makes you noble. You feel the equality of others to yourself. And the last, there's four phases of the path of application, which are called de, de, de sapa zemo chunchok, warmth, Tolerance, peak, and supreme phenomenon, or supremacy, maybe you could just call it. So these are the last steps of the alienated person, right? Where they have a certain kind of warmth. They're getting really focused on they're looking for the self. Then they tolerate the uh, not finding it, and they sustain that. Then they have like a peak experience as if they transcend themselves. And then they have in that last, that last second, they have a feeling as if they are supreme over everything. And then they become this noble being where their sense of identification expands. And then they, then they go through path of vision. 
And then the path of meditation where they have 81 different levels of purifying their unconscious instincts. And then they have the path of no more learning where they become an arhat if they're in the Theravada or they become a Buddha if they're in the Mahayana. Okay? But now that change from supreme to identifying with others is what sort of a change? In other words, if you become enlightened, wouldn't you expect somehow to... It's like Superman! <laughs> You're like, take off! Remember when Superman finally flies there out of the fortress of solitude? He goes whoosh, whoosh, and he bounces off a few mountains, and he goes down under water, and he goes around, and, he really, and then he goes up out into the stratosphere, right? Remember, he goes all berserk, you know? Has a feeling of supremacy. And yet a still alienated individual. Now, that exchange that's described so well in, a, in an earlier phase, but a very important phase, it's considered the first time of a kind of non experiential, visceral experience of selflessness. Uh, it's called, but which self experiences selflessness? <laughs> of course, the relative self does. But the selflessness experience of the relative self simply expands the sense of identification of the self, where the self begins to identify with other people as equal to the self. So it's like a, mo a person who is deeply in love, who's looking at the beloved, and then somehow feels the beloved, they are the beloved looking back at them. They consider that even more important than they're looking. I mean, they don't consider, they feel it that way, right? I mean, that, that's an experience that, or the child, you know? You know, the mother who puts the child's life over above hers. So if one had still some trace, struggling, although long developed at the, in his case, some trace of a feeling that I'm going to find, I'm going to come up with some kind of thing where I'll be so above and different from everybody, and then instead I am everybody. <laughs> That might be a surprise. <laughs> because they're not necessarily being above and beyond all. They're like freaking out. <laughs> and you are all of them. But luckily, you're all of them and seeing them as made of bliss and you see their inner manjushris and blah, 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 and whatever, you know. So supposedly, you don't get too upset. But at least you don't get to lounge in a sense of aloofness. How many gurus have you met who like, oh, I'm so above you. How many? Why do we like the Dalai Lama? He doesn't do like that. He, come, he goes in the hotel. He goes down in the kitchen. He walks in where the poor, like, underpaid, unregistered, undocumented little lady from San Salvador is, like, pressing the sheets with some big steam thing in some sort of a hell-like hot area at the bottom of the Waldorf. I walked with him through there. And they kind of, they look nervously at their boss and they come out and they smile at him. He shakes their hands and deals with them, considering them equal to himself. And actually more important than himself, of course, because there's more of them. And they're, and they're, they're sweating more than he is. <laughs> Although he was a hard worker. So I'm just saying, therefore, the you know, the, the great equation that this book is, which we'll come to, you'll see it in the third chapter. When you get to the third chapter, it's, it's, I gave a little more pages from the third chapter. You know, the equality of emptiness and relativity. The fact that emptiness is relativity. Or rather, they wouldn't put it quite like is, equate, but they would say the meaning of emptiness is equivalent to the meaning of relativity. Emptiness is relativity because full, thorough relativity means there, that all the relative things are empty of any non-relative element. That's what makes relativity compelling and all-embracing and all-encompassing, if you follow me. Of course, relativity is also emptiness, so it's also freedom. You don't, no, no particular circumstance within relativity completely entraps you, which is then that gets into kind of inconceivable, so never mind, we won't go around on that just yet. But, but, uh, but that was it, and I think a lot, certain people, you know, high lamas, high monks, found that just freaked them out. Because why? 
you can have, if you're a yogi, you can have experiences where the world seems to disappear. And you can be, and not, not in a bad way either, where it feels, you feel like you're like the sun. It's all the sun, or it's all the moon, or it's all, it's all bliss, or it's all vast space. And there's nothing to bother you in it. I call it the cheap oneness. I call it cheap because nobody's there. <laughs> so it's not a oneness that has to deal with differentiation. It all disappeared. But that cannot be the absolute as if it were something apart from all the relative things. Then that would be a non-empty emptiness. Then there would be an absolute emptiness. Thing in itself. And it itself wouldn't be empty. And emptiness, one of the 20 emptinesses is the emptiness of emptiness. So emptiness has no non-empty, absolute, intrinsic identity, objectivity, or reality. So emptiness, by, when it, it, through emptying itself, it becomes the non-dual with the, the relativity. So in a way there's kind of you no know, escape, in a way, and they didn't like that. In Hinduism, the Turiya, for example, which is because the Indians are always the best on all these things. Even Bertrand Russell agrees on interior matters. India is much, the Indian philosophy is unparalleled. Well, I think some of the Western mystics and Chinese mystics, Taoist mystics, are in the same ballpark. But the elaboration of it, the Indian ones are. But anyway, in the Turiya, the fourth state, what they call in Hinduism, is near, they equate it with Nirvikalpa Samadhi with just being a completely apart. Brahma waking from a dream, Tattvamazi, you are Brahma. And you are Brahma in a way where there's not been a creation. So there are no people to worry about. So if you, you know, if you come down from that exalted experience, you know, Ramakrishna or Mahamana Maharshi, you can just kind of hang out and then assume that when you die, you'll just be that vast thing apart from reality. And you're not going to overstress yourself to overturn the caste system when you come back. Because, you, because everybody else, you know, maybe they think they're suffering, but they're just an illusion. Someday they'll wake up and realize they never did exist. And you have experienced that as a powerful state, as concrete to you, or more concrete to you, than seeing this pillar or banging into this pillar through meditative, becoming a meditative adept. So such persons, and there were many, of course, there were many great yogis in Tibet who had big emptiness experiences. Are they going to be willing to say, gee whiz, the real thing makes me the servant of beings like Buddha was. Doesn't make me higher than them. Doesn't make me superior to anybody. But in a way, of course, Buddha is superior because he's the great servant of all beings, right? Something like that. Something in that direction. It's kind of needed, no? I think it's really neat, myself. I really do. Okay, any question? We have five minutes. <laughs> But we'll have more time for questions at other times. I'm sorry, I rambled on. But I'm trying to introduce things. Any question? Those? No? Okay. I'm sorry, yes? I'm a little perplexed for the difference between such and that. But that's the way to another time. I'm sorry, what? I'm a little perplexed by the difference between well, you know, if you, well, we could just say I'm perplexed about it too. <laughs> but, 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 and I've been looking and looking for, for someone to unpack it of the great Buddhist pundits and 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 you know masters in logic and things. But I didn't quite find that yet. In Sanskrit, it's tatha ta or tatva. Those two tatva means thatness. Tatha ta means suchness. And often translators translate them alternatively and they think it's the same. But you know, I think it's called, in Western grammar, it's called deictic and apodictic reference. 
I think those are the two terms, but I'm not sure. So one means it's referring to something as if it was really landing on it. And the other one is referring it indirectly or something like that. Apo, apo means take away from, you know, apotheosis, you know, taking away from something in Greek. And, uh, and, such, and such, when you say, oh, such as this, you, don't, you mean not, not exactly this, but such as this. You know, so like this, it means. So if you, if you make a duality of imminence uh, uh, in regard to duality, imminence and transcendence. You know, the, the one is leaning toward the transcendent and one is leaning toward the imminent. So the thatness is expressing a sense of the transcendent being invested within the imminence, with what is imminent to you. That's that. So the absolute emptiness is that, right? And then suchness is that that is revealing, is a mirror of the absolute <coughs> emptiness as if it takes you beyond itself. It transcends itself as you see it. And in a way they're the same, but there's a little subtle difference. For example, in Tantra, ignorance, the passion of ignorance, you know, the, the affliction of ignorance, the addiction actually of ignorance, it becomes uh, Vairochana, the mirror-like wisdom. And that also connects to form, what they call form, which really means matter. So sort of the most concrete sort of thing. So the concrete sort of things in that way of treating it is reflecting its own self-transcendence to you, uh, like a mirror. So the fact that it looks like it has intrinsic objectivity, it looks like it's not empty, reflects to you that, and you see it as not empty. The fact that you contact it, you relate to it in an ignorant manner, reflects to you that it is only relative and empty of any non-relative element. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so that's, that mirror-like thing is like suchness. And the thatness is, I don't know, it's just like wallowing in ignorance. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm perplexed too. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening and see you again. And, uh...